Hello and welcome to a new episode of Zeitgenossen Online. And my guest today is Professor Carol Sikora from the University of Buckingham. Good afternoon, Mr. Sikora. Good afternoon, Henrik. Good afternoon. Uh, Professor Sikora, you are an oncologist uh, for almost 50 years now, and you're currently the medical director of Rutherford Health, a company that uh, provides innovative cancer care. But uh, apart from that, you've also been a said professor of medicine at the Buckingham University. And in addition, you've been also the former director of the WHO cancer program. Um, so you have a renowned medical, you are a renowned medical professional uh, for decades. Um, you have a lot of experience. Um, what lesson had this pandemic taught you so far? I was completely taken by surprise, as many of us have been by the pandemic. When it first started trickling into the medical news in January and February, it was mainly confined to Wuhan in China. And I said to people, don't worry, it's not going to affect us. How wrong I was, I'm afraid. It really has profoundly affected all healthcare systems all throughout the world. Mm -hmm. Now, what's been interesting There's the many lessons learned that different healthcare systems have different levels of resilience within them, and populations have different levels of compliance with any central edict. So we've seen a very different way of handling both the general healthcare of populations and also specifically how COVID disease was actually handled around the world. Mm. Germany fantastic, death rate very low as a percentage, but that's probably because you can't calculate the COVID deaths in a much more scientific way than we do here, where everybody that is infected is counted as a COVID-related death, which is clearly not the case. So there are differences, but we'll learn from them. And as we move out, the analysis can be done. Mm. Uh, one viewer of this channel, his name is Darius, he commented on the last episode and he wrote, this coronavirus thing is the most overhyped um, event of my lifetime. Uh, what would you answer, Darius? Is this whole thing overhyped? It, it is overhyped. There's a level of hysteria involved. There's a level of fear, especially in Britain, where the strategy right at the beginning was to make people rigidly stay at home It was enforced that very lightly because people did, did, they did what they were told. And even our government was surprised how they managed to brainwash a whole population to do that. Even children, my three-year-old grandson brainwashed, mm -hmm. he, he keeps me away at two meters and shouts at me if I come closer, two meters, grandpa. Uh, and uh, we've got to get out of this now. Uh, and uh, I think that's the problem for people. What we're all scared, of course, is a second wave coming. Uh, mm -hmm. and, but it hasn't come in those countries such as Austria, Czech Republic, Denmark, Nor Norway, that came out six weeks ago now. So mm -hmm. as we move forward, we can move with much more confidence. Germany is slightly ahead of us in the pandemic, but only slightly. We're all coming out of it more or less at the same time. Mm -hmm. And the president, obviously, from Asia, from Singapore, from Wuhan from uh, Korea and so on, of how we get out of here. And at the moment, everything seems to be going reasonably well, I have to say. Would you want to be in the, in the shoes of politicians and decision makers at the moment? No. The politicians have had a difficult time. And the problem in different countries has been who's advising them. Ideally, we would have a, world, a very strong international organization like the WHO that would just tell governments, this is what you have to do, this is what you have to do at borders, this is quarantine rules, this is the, just the social distancing, this is face masks or no face masks, all these things, central body organized for the whole world. Mm. They show that kind of leadership. So they talk about one meter social distancing, uh, face masks, sort of rather wishy-washy, and I think Governments need much more solid data. They've consulted their own bodies, and there isn't that much data out there. But if we all did the same, that would be much more logical. And I think we're just, just today started in the UK a, a, a testing and tracing program 
um, this is going to cause huge controversy when it gets in. It's not enforced legally. In other words, you don't have to go into isolation if you bumped into someone yesterday that's mm -hmm. tested. You. But the recommendation is that you go into isolation. Mm -hmm. um, if it has to be enforced by the police, that will cause much more difficulty for, for this population. Mm. You just mentioned that there has a testing uh, campaign been launched in the UK. What is the uh, current situation in Great Britain like? Not all of our viewers uh, are staying in the UK. I mean, apart from the public di discussions uh, about some government representatives that who apparently do not see us so close to maintaining the lockdown measures, uh, but from a medical perspective, what's the situation like at the moment? That one of the problems is how you do the exemptions from any lockdown, how you allow certain people. So medical professionals seems reasonable. They've got to keep the hospitals open. Mm. Uh, but about politicians, are they exempt from it? Uh, and then not only that, um, if, if people don't have any symptoms, they don't have any fever, they're test negative, but they're only told to isolate because they've been in contact with someone, that's the lowest risk group. Can they go back if they are in certain jobs? The problem with the system is open to abuse as well. And uh, that's one of the problems. It's open abuse to people not wanting to go to work so they can claim benefits, uh, financial benefits. It's open to abuse the other way around where people are infected, but they desperately need to get back to work to feed their families. So they go, even though they know they've got a temperature and they suppress the temperature to get mm -hmm. essentially back to work so it's it's a very tricky area social solidarity works well in very disciplined societies but i'm afraid britain is not that disciplined mm -hmm. and regarding the medical numbers i mean do you also see a decline in the cases like uh, that can be observed in other countries absolutely the timing of decline is very surprising it's true that mm -hmm. social Distancing reduces the infectivity of the virus, the R0 number, the R0 number. But it's more than that. It seems to be, the infection seems to be weakening for some reason. So even though we've all adapted to it as a host, the parasite, that's the virus, also seems to be weakening. So it's no longer quite so infectious. So the infection rates come right down and the hospitalization has come precipitously down, so the hospitals are empty. And the biggest danger now is getting the health system started again. It's like, a, uh, you know, our system's like a battleship. It moves wonderful, but wonderfully, but once you changed course, it takes forever to change it round again at, at sea. So we've got to change it round to deal with my specialty, which is cancer, the cardiac, heart disease, mental health, all the things it does properly during the times of, of peace now have been totally disrupted and it's struggling to get back to normal. Mm. I just read an interview with uh, the other day with the viro virologist uh, Peter Peart from the London School of Hygiene and Tropical Medicine. He himself uh, became seriously ill with COVID-19 in March, I think. And um, in this interview, he referred to a study that concluded that the chance of dying is uh, 30, roughly about 30% if you end up in a British hospital. Um, that's about the same overall mortality rate as for Ebola in 2014 in West Africa. How can that be? So going into hospital for someone with coronavirus is the extreme end point. 50% of people that are infected have no symptoms at all. They don't even know they've had the disease. We know that now from repeated studies over the last few months. So 50% get symptoms, and of that 50% that get symptoms, they're mainly mild. They're just like having a cold, flu. Towards the, the top 5%, people start developing more serious illness. They go to bed for long periods. They get infection with other bugs at the same time. And about 2%, the actual oxygen level starts to fall, especially in older people. And there's a huge age spectrum. So younger people under 60, it's very rare to get serious problems. Older people, especially over 70 and 80, far more common if they get infected. Mm -hmm. So as we move through this, now seeing the pattern, which has been the same in all countries, uh, the one consistency 
the demographic of people that die from coronavirus tend to be older, uh, pre-existing morbidity, lung heart disease, obesity, metabolic syndromes, diabetes, kidney failure. These are the, the, the class of people that this virus likes to target and cause serious illness. The biggest puzzle is the lung infection and why it drops the oxygen in the blood so precipitously without that much damage on a scan, on a CT scan or a chest x Mm. in many cases, and yet the oxygen is falling precipitously, even when patients are on ventilators. And that, that's been a puzzle to my colleagues in intensive care. The antibody studies um, have been carried out over the last days, weeks, to determine how many people have actually been infected. Um, the first results that we receive so far are partly uh, sobering. Uh, the figures show that usually not more than, I think the highest number I saw was from New York, roughly about uh, 20%. But the range uh, varies between three to, let's say, 20%. Are these numbers, are these figures um, something that makes you confident that um, uh, we have dealt with COVID for the longest time? It is a puzzle. When we started, we tested our staff, our cancer center staff, with a, a kit from Korea and were surprised that the... Yeah, the, you, te you tested the staff yourself, right? Yes, yeah, yeah. we did it ourselves. And the, the incidence of antibodies was less than 7%, 8%, that sort of level. Uh, and yet people had been off, not that many, with coronavirus, and they'd be tested positive to the virus, yet the antibodies weren't there. So, and as we look, as you say, when you look at the world data now, the biggest study was in Spain, that was 60,000 people were tested by the Spanish government, and only 5% on average were positive for antibodies. It's yeah. true in Madrid, which was a, a bit of an epicenter for the pandemic, the percentage there was 20%, but in, take the average, it's only 5%. So my concept, and it's now been published, is that There are other factors than antibodies that give you immunity. So more people have been infected than test positive to the antibody. There are probably cellular factors in our the linings of our mucosa in the nose and throat that attack the virus and essentially destroy it before it mounts an antibody response. That's the most likely explanation. And we don't have a test for that. The key question in all this in any population, whether it's in Germany or in Britain, is how many people have been infected and how many people can go back to normality without social distancing, without anything, basically. And the answer is we just don't know at this point. And it's mm -hmm. just guess. And some people would say it's uh, up to 30%. Others would say it's still less than 5% overall. Mm -hmm. So I remember the discussion when everybody was said, when everyone said, um, we need antibody testing uh, to, to clarify how many people have been infected overall. But you would argue that this antibody testing is already no longer the thing, but is outdated. There are other somatic markers that would be more reliable when it comes to the immune defense of the body. Absolutely. And we don't have those good markers. I mean, I'd, the ideal test would be something, a little piece of paper you put under the tongue, not up the nose or anything, just under the tongue, saliva, And then you read within about two minutes, you get a reading of two things. One is the virus present. Is the, is, is the virus actually bits of the virus in the saliva? And the second one is, is the saliva producing antibodies to suggest that you've actually had and dealt with the infection? That's scientific uh, cloud cuckoo land, as we would say over yeah. here. It doesn't exist yet. Yeah. So just to... Just to clarify this for our viewers, so the human uh, immune response does not only consist of antibodies. So the human body has different mechanisms to uh, encounter a pathogen. Absolutely. So the first mechanism is cellular. And younger people, people under 30, seem to use those mechanisms. People over tend to let it go through that. The cells are overcome, the T cells are overcome by the virus, but then the antibodies kick in and destroy the virus. And so it's a combination. Mm -hmm. 
function. And of course, the, the T cells in the, in the immune system talk to the cells, the B cells that produce the antibody. So it's a very evolutionary advanced system that we have in the body, in the human body. Uh, and, you know, it's not surprising that actually finding a marker for past infection in the immune system is much more complex than just doing an antibody test kit. Okay. And would you suggest that also people who have never been exposed to the corona, so to this coronavirus, to SARS-CoV-2, that they also might have this um, immune response? Yes, it's interesting because MERS and SARS are coronaviruses. They're not the same one, they're previous ones. And most of us have got antibodies to them in our blood circulating. We're protected from those. They've been around a long time. I mean, mm -hmm. uh, SARS was 2003, MERS 2012. So they've been around a long time and we've adapted to them. Um, and along comes this relative of theirs, like a, a cousin of theirs, CoV-2, from the, the lab probably in Wuhan, we think. And it causes havoc in society. But some of us already have immunity because we're seeing cross talk between the old viruses we've been infected with in the past and this new virus coming along. But that protection is variable between different people. So that probably explains why some people have infection, but they're not showing no symptoms because they, they have protection from the symptoms of the disease by mopping it up, basically. Mm. Uh, you said repeatedly that it is likely that corona might ebb away naturally. Uh, how is that possible? I, I regard it rather like a dance. You have two partners. There's us, the host, and there's mm -hmm. the virus. The parasite and we're dancing around and to start with there was no immunity um, we were not socially distancing the virus itself was aggressive it was very infectious it caused played havoc in around the the structures of the world now we're much more careful we've dropped the uh, the chance the virus has of spreading by social distancing by changing our behavior the virus in turn has dropped its aggression And it looks as though to me that the virus is weakening. Some would say because the summer, it's find it more difficult to spread. It's more easily destroyed in the, in the summer sun than compared to the winter, the damp winters in, in Northern Europe that we both live in. And as we move forward, the dance has to come to an end. And we have to, what the virus wants is for us to embrace it, I guess, and keep it and live with it, just like SARS and MERS before. And uh, I suspect that's what's going to happen. And we're going to reach, an, if you like, a, a symbiotic relationship, an agreement with the virus to go long term. Mm. It sounds depressing, but it's the, probably the best way out. We're never going to get rid of it completely, but it doesn't have to be damaging to society. Mm. I saw your Twitter account the other day, and there was a woman posting a picture of crowded beaches in the UK, and commented it like, uh, you are one of the people creating this. I hope you know what you are doing. And another person said, uh, this guy is now actively peddling untruth. Uh, do you? No, I think that's a bit unfair. I think Twitter is a strange medium. There are people that are uh, out True. there that uh, you know, it's not for the faint heart. I've only been on it uh, two months, Henrik. And yeah. uh, It, it's, it's very bizarre. Uh, it's a very bizarre thing. How people have time to come to all this, to enter all this stuff, I have no idea. So you would just argue that's utter nonsense? That's, well, the, the, the beaches, you know, it's been very difficult to control here. Beaches are public places. Either you decide to shut them completely, get the police to clear the beaches. This has happened in the world. It's a great picture of Bondi Beach in Australia most famous beach in the world probably is the surfers, uh, beautiful surfers, all being cleared out by the police. Um, probably not what you want. You can do social distancing on a beach. I mean, it's uh, just as well as you can do it in your garden. And there's no reason people can't keep apart. Obviously, if there's a level of crowding, then it may be more difficult, but you can stop that if you wish to. It, it's all about individual decision-making and social responsibility versus legal enforcement of, 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 of complete lockdown and social distancing strategies. And that, that's a very delicate area for a society that's democratic and free as we all are. Hmm. 
Um, I, just, I mentioned him before, the, the um, virologist from London School of Hygiene and uh, Tropical Medicine, Peter Piot. Uh, he, he has said he suffered from COVID himself and he said, uh, gave a statement uh, saying that many people think COVID-19 kills about 1% of patients and the rest get away with some flu-like symptoms. But the story gets more complicated. There will be hundreds of thousands of people worldwide, possibly more, who will need treatments such as uh, renal dialysis uh, for the rest of their lives. Are the consequences that this disease can have still underestimated by many? I think they could be, and only time will tell. Uh, people that go to the intensive care unit have a 50% chance of dying of their disease, and they also have quite a high percentage, over 10%, of having continuous life-threatening implications, such as the ones you mentioned, kidney failure requiring dialysis or kidney transplant, liver failure requiring medication, These are all the problems that COVID causes, and we don't understand why. We don't quite understand either why the kidneys go into failure or why certain people are selected for that, and yet the majority don't. Uh, it's not everybody. So it's a very valid point. COVID is causing more disease amongst the infected patients that will be long-lasting. It's also causing the inability of the health service to deal with cancer, cardiac And, and mental health issues. And it's the same around the world. And mm. countries are having different resiliences in their healthcare system to get them back to normal. Some experts uh, already say that this pandemic is over. Uh, what do you think of this statement? I think it's nearly over, but we have to beware from second waves. Uh, WHO this week actually stated they didn't think anymore there would be a second wave which is reassuring, but none of us know until we've been there. The countries that came out first of lockdown was only six weeks ago, so that's too short a time to really be sure. The plan over here is that the second wave will come in September and that will go into the winter, which will make it even worse because hospital use is higher in winter with people, elderly folk with chest infections. And so we'll have to go into a lockdown again. Our health service will shut down. That's the most pessimistic view. And I, I think we have to plan for that. But meanwhile, we've got to get going with everything else. Otherwise, more people will die from non-COVID illnesses than from COVID-related disease. Yeah, that would be my next question. I mean, there are those claims that um, just as many people, if not more, will die from indirect consequences of the corona crisis. What do you think of that? I think absolutely true. And cancer is one. Um, heart disease is another, not so much acute heart disease where people have heart attacks, but all the preventive stuff, surgery for valve disease, surgery for coronary artery um, obliteration, all these things have stopped. And that means people will die unless we get moving. The longer it goes without getting intervention, the longer it will be. And then the, the third specialty that really affects is mental health. And mm -hmm. so pediatric services have sort of been sidelined in all this. And yet there are people that get quite disturbed by even because of Corona, the whole situation society is in has made a whole lot of people even more disturbed than they would be. And their underlying mental health problems are not being treated. So getting us out of here is in everybody's interest. Mm -hmm. Uh, we saw some hotspots over the course of the last month, um, including UK, but also especially in Italy, Spain, France, New York. Um, however, the coronavirus is documented in roughly 190 countries so far. So should we get reports from many other countries in the world showing similar images like the one we saw in, for instance, in Italy? Hopefully not. Latin America's got it bad, as you know, at the moment. So Brazil is mm. the, the most affected country. Um, basically, what's fascinating is when the virus left Wuhan, if we assume it arose there, it got on a plane. It probably travels first class, Henrik. I'm sure it does. You <laughs> champagne all the way. And it just went round the airways. It just went round the airways of the well. And mm. After going to the cruise ships and the luxury hotels where older people go there, they dance the night away in the throats of people on the cruise ships. This went everywhere. And uh, 
that's been the very curious thing about this. The SARS and MERS, there was a geographical location some countries had more than others. Here, it seemed to really just got moving on the whole, the whole globe, basically. And, but it is going everywhere. Latin America will be the last. It's just different time points. Uh, can you see parallels to the swine flu uh, that happened back in 2009? U.S. public health authority published a, a, a document in 2012, and they found out that this flu led to more than 500,000 deaths at that time. Um, that's quite a number. Uh, um, that is a number. I mean, swine flu has been around since 1918. That was the first epidemic, pandemic of swine flu. During World War I, the information, it was called Spanish flu. And the reason it's called Spanish flu is that Spain was in in that war and therefore they published all the data the Germans mm. the British and the Allies on our side didn't publish anything they kept it as a, a military secret because the mm. soldiers, young, healthy young soldiers were dying it on both sides of the conflict so uh, the Spanish flu killed more in the second wave later on in 2018 than it did in the first wave and that's the worry with this it's a different virus it's an influenza virus And as you say, it came back in 2009. Uh, it actually came back when I was a medical student in 1970. So uh, as we move forward, we can't learn that much from influenza pandemics for this because the, it, it's a different virus, different structure, and probably different epidemiology. But as we move along with the, the, the coronavirus, it's clear It could happen again. It could be a different. It could be a second wave of this, or a new one could emerge. All healthcare systems, I'm sure now, will put into place elaborate precautionary measures to try and reduce the impact of any new uh, viral episode like this. Th this is the first time a pandemic has been played out on television screens. People are not working, of course. Most people are at home. 24/7 television is the novelty here. Uh, it wasn't around 20 years ago, it is now. It's continuous, wall-to-wall -wall corona in Britain on the news mm. now, mm. on the BBC and the independent news. Uh, and it's, it can be damaging. Um, also, the internet allows information. You can look at numbers instantly anywhere in the world, up to date within the last few hours of deaths, of destruction, and so on. In, And you can interpret it yourself, whereas in the past you couldn't have access to that kind of real-time information. Mm -hmm. uh, liability may vary, but the information is up there to look at. Mm -hmm. so very do you disturbing for some people. Do you think that this uh, pandemic will have lasting psychological impacts on society? And if so, which? I think both. Uh, you know, it will have lasting And it, how long we'll have this problem, how deep the problem will be, will depend how quickly we can move forward now. So if we can really open borders in Europe on the 15th of June as being proposed, uh, if we can really start the holiday season and the holiday destinations, if we can start flying again, I think people will gradually come out of it and realize that maybe we don't need two meters social distancing, maybe one meter is enough, as the WHO recommend. In Germany, it's 1.5 meters. Here, it's two meters. All these things are important to move along to the next step, all the time monitoring what's actually happening to the infection rate. Mm. Uh, the World Health Organization plays a central role in this pandemic, of course. Uh, some actions and um, decisions of the WHO have been criticized. Some say that this pandemic has been a political disaster for the organization. How do you assess this? So the WHO is a great organization. It's the only one we've got, works in 196 countries and is the, the beacon of international health care. The problem it has is it's, it can't handle this sort of global attention very well. I and mean, it's not handled well. It's not being pragmatic enough. You need proper uh, dictated 
sort of statements, this is what you have to do, and it hasn't grabbed that. At the beginning, it didn't recognize the Wuhan problem. It didn't, the inspectors were sent there. They were probably fogged off by the Chinese. The Chinese are a big donor to the WHO. They also got the current director general elected above other candidates, one, one from Britain, one from Pakistan. And so, uh, you know, how this all interplays, we don't know. But to me, as a pragmatist, it doesn't matter. We've got to move forward with all this. And that's what we need to see moving forward with an international organization that can make the edicts. Mm. Is the WHO as an organization, is it um, independent enough to, uh, to, to, to encounter such pandemics? I think it is. Uh, it, it's contributed to by all the countries. The amount contributed, America is the biggest contributor, the US is the biggest contributor at $415 million. And the calculation on how much people contribute depends on the size of the country and the wealth of the country. So it seems a fair way of doing it. Uh, the difficulty is what power do they have to enact? They don't. They can only act through local governments of the member states. Mm -hmm. um, It is top heavy. Bureaucracy is fierce. Everything is translated into six languages. Uh, and I think we just have to get over this now and, and move forward and strengthen international health. There's no other organization that can do it now. The United Nations uh, was set up at the end of the war and is really came, coming out of the League of Nations. And there's no doubt that the organization have a role to play One can't be top heavy with the bureaucracy and light on the on the field services. And that's probably what's missing here. There's a lot of bureaucracy at the top. And actually, it's the people at the level of managing infection that need to speak out and come up with plans to advise governments. Mm -hmm. You mentioned that the states are the biggest donator. However, the second biggest donator is a private organization and it's a foundation. And some people, let's also... Uh, part of this, all these conspiracy theories uh, that some people claim that uh, the secret head of the uh, WHO uh, might be the Gates Foundation. Uh, how do you evaluate such commitments? I, it, it's very difficult. You're right. The vaccine program the WHO sponsors is funded by the, uh, the Bill and Melinda Gates Foundation. Huge amounts of money. Um, the, having spent three years working with it, and still I still go to Geneva occasionally, I can't see any evidence that they're dictating policy. Having said that, uh, you know, it, it, all sorts of rumors, all sorts of talk, um, but you know, what the WHO does well is educate poorer countries and how to deal with what they can actually afford to do. And what I learned in my time, something like cancer, you can do very expensive or you can do cheap and cheerful cancer care. And mm. if you can afford uh, the latest drug that costs $100,000 a time for a year, there's no point trying to get those going in a poor country. Just get the basics going to begin with and then move up, developing that sort of strategic plan. And that, that's something you can do for any type of disease, heart disease, infection control, and so on. So do it sustainably. And they, uh, the idea is that the sustainable health care is the key to any developing country's budget. Mm. So to complete this topic, uh, some, some member states uh, demand reforms that now to be uh, conducted. Um, but you wouldn't you wouldn't say that there needs to be anything uh, adjusted uh, within the World Health Organization. There's huge amounts to be adjusted. I was there 20 years ago, and uh, it was all about reform then, and it's still all about reform. It's not moved on. Pieces of work rep are represented by documents. That's not a piece of work. It's the implementation of the documents, contents that what is what matters. So forward it's got to be about getting a, a credible organization well respected and effective at dealing with a new corona pandemic or whatever else the healthcare needs of the world become mm -hmm. uh, in case it turns out differently than you predicted and we um, we um, have a second spike uh, arriving in in fall uh, would you be in favor of a compulsory uh, vaccination If we have a vaccine, that would be good. I wouldn't be in favor of anything compulsory. I think that would be very dangerous. I'm sure we could find 60% of 
to the population to volunteer for it. I'd volunteer for it. I'd be happy to do it. I don't think we'll have a vaccine before the this virus goes away. That's my prediction. Mm-hmm. I don't think it'll be ready in September. And vaccinating in our country, 66 million people, roughly the same in Germany, is not a mean feat logistically. Um, to get that vaccine out there, having tested it, tested for safety, tested for efficacy at a time when the virus is going down, so there's not so many people are going to get infected, which means you have to have a bigger control group and a bigger active group. Unless you do live challenge, which is unethical, we'll end up stuck with having to wait for the day to till Christmas, and then we won't actually be able to go and immunize people until January or February. So it'll take a lot longer than we think. To, even if we've got a good um, front runner, which we seem to have, there are three seemingly good front runners out there. Hmm. Why do you think it is dangerous to introduce a compulsory vaccine? Um, Because there's, there is the anti-vax movement. There are a lot of people that don't believe in vaccines. To make anything compulsory, how do you police it? What do you do? Do you get the police to come and hold someone down while you inject them? That would be the mm-hmm. extreme. It could happen in China. And uh, there would be some dis- rather disturbing scenes of China, of people being dragged away into isolation and so on. But I think in, in Europe, we're not. we used to personal freedom. Most people would want to be vaccinated if they felt it would work. They would trust the, the healthcare system. I get vaccinated for, immunized for influenza every year, even though it's not perfect. Um, mm. and, and because I'm a healthcare worker and therefore it seems advisable to have it. It's not perfect because there are mutations all the time that change and therefore it may not be giving me that much immunity to the latest mutation. With this, I'd have it But if, if someone else really didn't want it for any reason, I'd say that's fine. You know, just, mm. uh, it's just persuades 60% and then we've got immunity. What should be done now from your point of view? Is there anything to do or do, do we just have to uh, sit and lay back and wait until it's gone? We have to gradually get further and further out of lockdown, monitor what's happening in terms of the numbers, and hopefully it will go. Uh, you know, it's, it's, it's worked in the countries coming out uh, in, in Europe and Scandinavia. And as you come out in Germany, as we come out here, close monitoring is clearly in order as we move forward. Mm-hmm. Professor Sikora, many thanks for taking your time, for um, giving us your answers. And um, if there's a second wave coming in, the, in, in fall, uh, we talk again. <laughs> Thank you. Don't be a pessimist. <laughs> <Okay>. <laughs> Thank you. I'm going to have my lunch now. <laughs> yeah, go for it. <laughs> Thank Enjoy. you very much. Good to see you. talk to you.